I'm David Flinders. This is Conversations with Conservatives, which is coming to you from Safe Wales TV on the Gold Coast in Queensland, Australia. And our conversation today is with Professor James Allen, who's Garrick Professor of Law at the University of Queensland, the oldest chair in that university. Uh, and uh, Jim, if I may call you Jim. Sure. Jim. Good afternoon, David. Thank you. Jim, you have taken a position concerning the Turnbull government, and your position, if I may quote you correctly, is that uh, you you feel that uh, the, the government should be defeated because it has lost the trust of the people, something to that effect? So my view is that in the long term, if you're a right of center, small government, national sovereignty, strong border sort of person, as I am, that you're better off, and this is going to sound weird, but you're better off if Shorten wins this election, not because Shorten will be good, he'll be appalling. But the problem is, is that at least if he wins, the uh, Liberal Party will, there's at least a chance the Liberal Party will restructure, get rid of Mr. Turnbull, who is the most left of center Liberal Party leader ever, and uh, offer up an opposition. And so if you think instead of what's the best outcome in this election, short term, I mean, clearly Turnbull's better than Shorten. But if your question is, will the country be better off three elections from now? I mean, you can see that Turnbull will win, and then he'll either win again or he'll lose, and then we'll have an even farther left Labour Party. So three elections down the road, it's going to be bleak. Whereas if you suffer three years of Shorten, and then you get a, a reinvigorated uh, coalition, even if they lose two in a row, uh, we will be better off in the long term. John O'Sullivan, the uh, short-term present uh, editor of Quadrant and the former speechwriter for Maggie Thatcher, uh, he always makes the point that oppositions matter. And so with Mr. Uh, Mr. Turnbull being so far left, of course that gives room for Mr. Shorten to move even farther left. You, can, you, you would know for sure that had Mr. Abbott still been in place, Mr. Shorten's policies would be a lot farther to the right they would have to be. Uh, so my, my thinking is in the long term, Anybody with my sort of views, if you're supporting the most left-wing liberal leader ever, the man who is worse on 18C even than Abbott, who was a disappointment, the man who is appointing people such as Ed Santow to the Human Rights Commission, who's reappointed Martin Parkinson, who then went on to appoint a Greens woman to the deputy secretary social policy position, which is a very high position. I mean, you are basically supporting what is in effect a labor government set of policies. I don't think there's any doubt that Mr. Turnbull is to the left of Paul Keating on everything. There's a fear so, among many conservatives who agree with you as to the position, the default position of the prime minister that he is uh, essentially left wing and his natural position is there. But there's a feeling among a number of conservatives that uh, having shortened in even for even for just one term, could do immense damage, both in terms of the finance of the country, but also in relation to the borders, that Labour would spend enormously, put us into even greater debt, and that also they would relax the border controls and we would, be, we would find again that there was a vast influx of illegal immigrants. Well, unless you believe that the coalition is going to win every election from now until uh, the end of time, which I don't actually believe, sooner or later, Labour is going to get in. And what matters is having a coalition party whose policies are broadly palatable. Uh, you're not going to be on the winning side of every policy. And I mean, I, 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 did, I think that Mr. Abbott made a lot of mistakes. He was terrible on 18C. And, you know, he was an old fashioned sort of social Democrat on things like paid parental leave. But on the big issues, he got them right. And the party, by axing him, caved into what I think of as the ABC worldview. Uh, the sort of, this is a, a change in leader that has been driven by the media, which has a visceral dislike of anybody who's remotely sort of right of center. And if you reward that, then you're, you're sort of in keeping with the advice that Mr. Turnbull has gotten that you can just ignore people on the right of cent renter. I, I, uh, it was Mr. Texter, I think, who said people like us don't matter at all because at the end of the day, we will vote 
coalition. It doesn't matter what Mr. Turnbull does, you will vote coalition. And so everyone who votes for Mr. Turnbull is actually proving that he's right. I, I don't think all of the coalition supporters are doing that. I'm certainly not. But if, if, if once somebody knows you're in their back pocket, it doesn't matter what they do, as long as you're a centimeter to the right of Shorten, then of course they will move to become a centimeter to the right of Shorten. You well, have to punish these people politically. Otherwise, they will start taking the advice of people like Mr. Texter. That it just really doesn't matter anyone on the right of politics. Texter's, uh, Mr. Texter's thesis was uh, conservatives didn't matter because they would pick up votes in the centre. But they don't seem to be picking up votes in the centre. It is very close indeed. And uh, all of those people who were saying that they were going to vote for Malcolm Turnbull didn't do that, even in the North Sydney by-election, where there was a swing of 13% against the Liberals. Well, David, you and I both knew that nobody who's a sort of inner-city, ABC, latte-sipping progressive, however <laughs> much they like Mr. Turnbull personally, because he shares so many of their views, they were never going to vote for him. Yes. It was never going to happen. So the 54 Brutuses who stabbed Mr. Abbott in the back um, either agree with Mr. Turnbull or they got sucked in by this view that he was going to win all of these votes. Now, there's an exception to that. Had Mr. Turnbull called an election immediately after taking over, I think he would have won a landslide. I, think, I, I said that in print. I said he has to call it now. I, I think I predicted he would end up losing, but it, we'll see. But we, back a few elections ago in New Zealand, it happened to Jenny Shipley after a leadership spill. She was very popular and she did she did not call the election. And that's what Mr. Turnbull did. And uh, I think he's waited long enough that uh, he could lose in a hung parliament. He could win with one seat. Um, my fear is that the coalition, I mean, you hear all these people saying, oh, the party will control Turnbull. There is no reason to think that at all. He, every single move he has made since taking over last September is to the left. You can't pick a single solitary policy where he has moved from the Abbott position to a more right-wing position. That's clear. Whenever he has a discretion, he seems to move, you're quite right, to the left. Uh, when, uh, when, Kevin Rudd, when, when Kevin Rudd should have gone to an election, that was in the, 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 he had the opportunity of going to a double dissolution and... Uh, he decided not to, and he decided to continue in relation to global warming, and that's where he seduced Malcolm Turnbull, and uh, that inevitably led to the uh, collapse of the Turnbull leadership and, the, uh, and uh, Tony Abbott coming to power. But on that point, uh, we have to go to a break. We'll come back again and uh, resume this very interesting conversation. Thanks, I'm, David. Thank you. I'm in conversation with... Uh, Professor Jim Allen of the University of Queensland, and this is Conversations with Conservatives. I'm David Flint, and this is Conversations with Conservatives, and I'm in conversation with Professor James Allen of the University of Queensland. Jim, you have an, a most impressive uh, series of publications, not only in the pure law field, but in uh, what can best be described as uh, politics. And uh, there was a wonderful uh, comment in your book, in the description of your book, Democracy in Decline, where you See that you say that democracy is being diluted and restricted in five of the world's oldest democracies. So, is what is happening in Australia that is the 
takeover of the Conservative Party by the left. Is that also happening in other countries? Uh, so the, the, the theme of my book is that uh, bills of rights with very potent judges and this move to uh, say that you're sort of blo locked in by international law is undercutting the scope for people in the oldest democracies in the world to make social policy choices. So in terms of international law, it is really in a very elitist project. The decisions they make are often bad decisions. And I mean, even in rights respecting terms, there's no reason to take the advice of say the U United Nations Human Rights Council, which has you know made resolutions against Israel more often than they have made resolutions against every other country on earth put together and have never sanctioned Saudi Arabia ever. I mean, these are joke institutions. You wouldn't take moral advice from them if your life depended on it. And you get so many people on in, in sort of uh, powerful positions now saying, well, we have to do X because international law tells us so. International law is not a democratic sort of body of laws. Treaties are made under prerogative power. Um, customary international law hasn't got a democratic bone in its body. And bills of rights are a disaster because they, you know, they allow judges five to four to impose same-sex marriage on an entire 330 million people or whatever. So in those terms, Australia looks pretty good still. We haven't got a bill of rights. Um, we have a, politicians who are still moderately vigorous, even on the left. You've got, um, I, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm quite sympathetic to the old-fashioned Dennis Healy um, labor sort of leaders. Uh, who just care about redistribution of wealth. It's not me, but I understand what they're coming from, but they're not politically correct. Sort of the Michael Costas of the world, they look much better than anybody who's running right now. Um, but that's not really who's running on the left. I think the left, uh, the sort of progressive inner city um, barrister for human rights type crowd has overtaken the old fashioned Labour Party, which was much more palatable to me didn't and Kim Beasley's uh, didn't Kim Beasley's father say once that uh, when he first joined the Labour Party it consisted of the cream of the working class, but now consists of the dregs of the middle class? Pretty much, a, pretty much accurate statement. I think there's something by George Orwell somewhere on the on the pier to Wigan, the, some, the road to Wigan Pier, or one of them where he he describes going into a Labour Party meeting, and I'm paraphrasing and updating, but you know the radical feminists are there. The PETA people are over there, um, you know, the human rights barristers are over there, and, and uh, George Orwell, a man of the left, said, you know, after 10 minutes with these people, I don't want to vote for the Labour Party anymore. So that's sort of the kind of crowd that uh, seems to me to have won much of the Labour Party. There's no, nothing attractive about them at all, except that they're still better than the Greens. Well, uh, let's come back to Australia. What would you advise a disgruntled Conservative to do? in the coming election how should they vote so there's a hierarchy of choices i am going to put personally going to put labor ahead of liberals at the very bottom of the ticket but if you don't want to do that you can't bring yourself to do that you still should not make the liberals your first preference put some other little party above that make the libs second and they'll lose a lot of money in campaign finance terms because that's determined based on first preferences um, in the Senate, you have a whole panoply of choices. Uh, many of the ringleaders who took out Mr. Abbott were in the Senate. I don't think there's any reason to vote for any liberals in the Senate at all. Uh, it's the, whoever wins the House forms government. There's lots of little parties that are moderately attractive. With the change to the Senate voting, um, you can go below the line and just pick 12 people. And they don't, none of them have to be liberals. And if you, you go effectively, above the line, you can pick six. Yes, you effectively uh, can do an optional preference correct. with the Senate, can't you? You can. Either above and, or below. And I mean, I, I, I am very disillusioned with the American-style Senate we have. Uh, I, I, I personally would, I think the change to the voting system that was made is a theoretical improvement in the Senate. But if you're going to spend the political capital, they really ought to have changed it a lot more because we're going to still have crazy Jackie Lambie independence. They're still going to block political mandates. And so, you know, it's a bit like this double dissolution election. What huh? was the point? What was the point? Oh, I yes. mean, you could have run up 50 or 60 bills and then had a double dissolution that made, you know, was worth something. This is just a sort of half-hearted, very 
uh, emasculated labor relations bill that isn't going to do much one way or another. That's why we're having a double dissolution election. Would, would you like to name the uh, conservative parties in the Senate? Uh, for example, there's the Australian Liberty Alliance, there are the Christian Democrats, there's uh, Pauline uh, Hanson's One Nation. Are they all <laughs> yeah, conservative there's uh, parties? First, there's, I wouldn't vote for Pauline Hanson for other reasons, but family first, there's the Liberal Democrats. I don't like some of the things the Liberal Democrats do, and I certainly can't stand their open borders, but on money matters, having one or two of them in the Senate is quite, quite good because they actually believe that spending has to be cut and they're prepared to vote for it. And off the top of my head, I can't think of any, Bob, sorry, Bob Day also votes for cutting spending, but that's it. And one of the weird things is that you hear people say that we have an obstructionist Senate that blocks everything, but that was, that's only true since Mr. Abbott came into office, they didn't block anything for Julia Gillard or Kevin Rudd. If you want more spending, the Lambies and the guys who like cars and the ex-rugby league players, they always vote yes. Those so odd ones are not likely to emerge with the new system of preferences, are they? They only came up because of the way in which the politicians stole the people's preferences and then did deals behind closed doors. Well, with the quota on a double dissolution election, it's possible that Lionhelm will come back in. Uh, yes. Bob Day, possibly. He's probably got a better shot. You're right, though. If it weren't a double dissolution, they would be stuffed, I think. I think it would be difficult. So uh, you would suggest that people at least not give their first preference to the Liberal Party if they're disgruntled, as many Absolutely. people are. There's no reason to give your first preference because if you pick the... Uh, you know, walking out the door party is your first preference and then make the libs your second. Their preferences will all flow down to the libs anyway and the liberals won't get any money. You made um, an interesting you, you point. Punish them in any way you can. Again, I think if you look at this so in the long term and not in terms of a snapshot where you're just looking at this election, then in the long term our country will be better off if we get Mr. Turnbull out. There are a lot of conservative uh, parts of the media who seem to be campaigning for Malcolm Turnbull. For example, News Limited seems to have taken that position. They have been running as the Turnbull Times, and I, I used to write a lot for the Australian. It's still the best newspaper in the country, and it still has the most diversity of views. But the one view it doesn't have is any criticism of Mr. Turnbull from the right, maybe Maurice Newman. They allowed Nikki Savitt to run a year-and-a-half-long diatribe campaign against um, Mr. Abbott, without really ever declaring the sort of personal interest she had with her husband, uh, they allowed Peter Van Onselen to run a hatchet job campaign, and the list goes on. Yes, and, and on that point, if I can just interrupt you, I think we have to go to a break. We'll come back and follow that. Uh, Great, thank I, you. Th this is uh, Conversations with the Conservatives, and uh, I'm talking to Professor Jim Allen of the University of Queensland. Hello everyone, I'm Paul Higgins, and welcome to Safe Worlds TV, the global marketplace, the world leader in internet TV and semantic search, the home of free enterprise, the level playing field that all the world can use for electronic business. With Safe Worlds TV, every business in every country of the world can now be involved in the world economy. There are no barriers to entry. Even the poorest countries and the smallest businesses can be involved. The system is simple. Every country divides into 12 headline channels. Every channel is a gateway to an unlimited number of related community channels. Every community is a social network and a marketplace to sell products and services. There is no limit to the number of businesses that can be connected into a marketplace. There is no limit to the number of products you can sell. All our channels and marketplaces are designed to keep you entertained and to help you do internet business 
at a cost that everyone can afford. The amazing semantic technology that underpins SafeWorlds TV allows us to deliver this amazing system to the world. It allows us to accommodate millions of TV channels and marketplaces and to link them together into the global marketplace. The vast global marketplace that we are building is the final piece of the electronic global village. This is the ultimate achievement of the internet. What you see here now is only the tip of the iceberg of semantic services that are coming. Come now and see what we've already got. Choose any country of the world, then select the headline channel that you want to explore. Just point and click and follow the logical tree structure. We think you'll be amazed at what we already have in Safe Worlds TV. When you're ready, click on the button at the bottom of the screen and register to become a user. You can start immediately to create your very own internet TV channel. Enjoy the experience. I'm Paul Higgins for Safe Worlds TV. I'm David Flinton, and this is Conversations with Conservatives, and I'm speaking with Professor Jim Allen of the University of Queensland. Jim, one of the, uh, one of the extraordinary things that the Turnbull government did just before they sought this election was to include in the budget a, a provision against superannuation. Uh, as some people said, they came like thieves in the night after people's superannuation, after the treasurer himself had assured people that they would not do that. And uh, that was a, a promise on which the present government was elected. How do you feel about that? So there's the politics and the underlying merits. I think they're both bad. The politics are clearly crazy going after your core supporters. I, I It just shows the, the extent of Mr. Turnbull's uh, ego i suppose he uh he did this uh, it would appear it was a captain's pick it seems like a lot worse captain's pick to me than anything mr abbott did but that's the politics you know the underlying merits i don't like it for a number of reasons uh one i think it is retrospective or at least certain aspects of it are retrospective and people in reply will say well every time you change the income tax tax rate that's retrospective but it's not the difference here is you can't pull your money out of, so you've, you've, you've put money into the super on a set of uh, understandings and then they come along and they change it and you can't get the money out. If they change the uh, income tax rate, you can just stop working or you can you know, sail around the world or you can cut back on your hours. But you can't do that with super. So I think it is retrospective. And even leaving that issue aside, I don't like the actual substance of what they have done. I think 1.6 million is too low and a half a million uh, lifetime country is massively too low. And perhaps, you know, if you with today's ultra low interest rates, if you take $1.6 million and go to buy an annuity, it's barely gonna get you more than the age pension. So people who work their entire life and save and are thriftful are going to end up with barely more than than uh, the sort of George Bess of the world who blow all their money on booze and fast women. And, uh, <laughs> you know, that's that's a bad incentive scheme. And the whole point is surely to get people off the welfare so that they're looking after themselves. These are aspirational voters. Sure. Who have suddenly and, been so attacked the signals, by... signals, the incentives are all wrong. I mean, in one sense, the superannuation policy has been a total failure. If if your goal is to take people off the age pension, it really hasn't, hasn't, done, it hasn't done much 
and a bad thing, and we, we could probably admit that. Um, I guess the thing that possibly irks me the most, though, is that a right-of-center liberal government went after people with defined contribution pensions and basically left untouched. There was a few genuflections about what they're going to do in the future, but nobody believes that. But they basically left untouched people with defined benefit uh, pensions. So the judges and some of the ex-MPs. And so they have the most phenomenal platinum-plated pensions of all time. And we're not going to be trying to raise more money to balance the... The, uh, to get rid of the deficit on the backs of those people, we're going to do it on the people who've worked their whole lives and have a defined contrib contribution pension. What do you so say to the about the process? If you're going to touch superannuation, I would have thought you go very slowly. You you issue a white paper. You have a you have some sort of investigation. You try to bring everybody together and say that well everybody comes together and they say well this is a reasonable conclusion if there is a problem with superannuation. Well, but that, that overlooks the fact, David, that uh, Mr. Turnbull's the smartest man in the room and he can just do it on the back of an envelope and, uh, you know, and get this great policy on being, of course, wholly facetious. Uh, of course, yours is the better way to do it. And it's particularly the case when these are your core long-term voters. So again, if these people who are being hammered on the superannuation want to return Mr. Turnbull, by all means, go and vote for him. Um, but I'm not going to do that. Again, well, I think... The Liberal Party here is, it, it's disgraceful that they're letting off people with the the sort of civil servant, public service, ex-politician ex, uh, people with these defined benefit uh, pensions that are linked to the cost of living. Uh, and to get the sort of pension that they're going to get, you'd probably have to have five or six million dollars in your, in your account to buy that sort of an annuity that would give you that. So yes, there's it, still it's so unfair in that term yes. that you know that there's no way that people on the right of center can can find these palatable. Yes, the other, there's still the people. Sorry, the other thing I don't like is calling it a saving. What they are doing is increasing taxes. When you when you eliminate a tax concession, you are increasing taxes in effect. This so is on the basis, is it not? Benefit. This is on the basis, is it not, Jim? That all money belongs to the government. And if they, if they don't tax you 100%, they're really giving you something. Correct, when in fact it's our money and they're taking it away from us. And of course, to some extent, you need to, to do that, to run a defense and to run schools. But when you take in more money from hardworking people to balance the, to try to lower the deficit, you're doing it by taking more money from people. And what I would... think you could easily balance, the, get rid of the deficit yes. tomorrow by cutting government spending. If we went back to the level of spending we had in 2007, when we, when the voters in this country stupidly voted for Kevin Rudd, and by the way, the Australian newspaper advocated for Rudd in 2007, so the uh, view of the Australian as being a rapidly right-wing paper, that was the worst electoral choice probably in the last few decades. And can I interrupt you on that? Chris Mitchell, who was who was the editor of the Australian at the time, recently said in a, an interview in a minor uh, in a back page of the Australian, he said that uh, that was his worst. The very worst thing he did as editor was to persuade Rupert Murdoch to support Kevin Rudd. Well, the second worst thing he did was to let Nikki Savage, sorry <laughs> Sava, run a year and a half long diatribe campaign um, where she couldn't write a single column without you know, going crazy about Mr. Abbott. So that was the second worst thing he did. But you're right, it was a terrible decision. And so when they come out and say, you know, we can trust Mr. Turnbull and Mr. Turnbull's going to be fine down the road and the party's going to control yes. him, I am very skeptical on all those fronts. If he Do wins an election with a mandate of his own, even if it's a seat or two, he's moving the party left. But just on that, if he, if he scrapes back in or wins, he certainly won't win the Senate. He probably won't win a majority at a joint sitting. That indicates that probably the bills which triggered the double dissolution will never be passed. Won't that damage his credibility? Oh, I'd like to think so, but he's got a lot of cheerleaders in the press. And again, you know, if he decides after the election to move left, 
which implies more spending and more big government policies, and you'll spend a billion on innovation, which is what he's done, and a billion on renewable energy. The Senate doesn't block those sort of things. All of the sort of Jackie Lambie crazy independents, they're not going to block that. So I don't think the Senate is going to be a problem for him after the election if he moves left. But will they, will it be a... Speak Big, big government. Yes, but to stop you on that, will the Senate be a problem in relation to the, the legislation which triggered the double dissolution? Oh, yeah, I think they'll block that. Yes. But I don't know that Mr. A Mr. Turnbull cares about that very much. He doesn't seem to be passionate, and even no. with the outrageous acts of the Victorian government in relation to the volunteer bushfires, bushfighters, he didn't seem to take a strong position on that. Tony Abbott was better. David, it's always hard to argue about counterfactuals, but my, my view is that if Abbott were leading the Liberals right now, they'd be miles ahead because he would be focusing on the boats and the danger of Shorten. He'd be focusing on um, all this boondoggle stuff on climate, which Mr. Turnbull can't. I mean, basically, Turnbull has run a terrible yes. campaign. Jim, on that, I'm afraid. I'm afraid that time has caught up with us and I'm being wound up and I'm afraid we have to come to a conclusion. This is Conversation with Conservatives, and I'm in conversation with Professor Jim Allen. And uh, Jim, we thank you very much.